Good evening and welcome to our eighth installment of Kingston's Buried Treasures. Uh, the subject tonight is, uh, is very appropriate. The subject tonight is John Vanderlyn. Uh, and it is so appropriate because we are in the John Vanderlyn Gallery of the Senate House Museum, which holds the largest collection of John Vanderlyn works in the world. Uh, and our presenter tonight is Joe Tantillo. And again, we are incredibly fortunate to have Joe as our presenter because not only is Joe uh, an artist and has a, a, a unique appreciation of John Vanderlyn, but Joe is also the, the, uh, the visual representative of Kingston's Buried Treasures. All of our uh, visual media is created by Joe. Joe created the, uh, our logo, Kingston's Buried Treasures. Joe cre has created all of our uh, flyers, which many people uh, have seen and, and come to our, our presentations as a result of. So Joe is truly an artist. And he, has, he is probably the most integral part of Kingston's Buried Treasure, and we are proud uh, to have him here tonight to present on Kingston's most famous painter, uh, John Vanderlyn. Joe? Well, thank you very much for that great introduction, Paul. And um, what I'm going to be talking about tonight has to do with the room we are in. Uh, the room we are in has, um, has many, many uh, of the artifacts of, of, uh, of John Vanderlyn. And it is also organized in a certain way that most people wouldn't realize if they were here. Uh, it starts in the back of the room and um, at his earliest work, and it slowly works you through the years of his life and the important things that happened to his life all the way around the room till we get to the back, which is um, at the end of his life. So um, I'll be showing pictures in my presentation that are drawn from the pictures that are on the walls of this room. Um, one of the more interesting pictures that I'm showing in this uh, in this introductory slide is the, the portrait of John Vanderlyn, which is in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, that particular piece um, is extremely light sensitive, and there's uh, on one of these, on one wall here, we have a curtain, a black curtain over something, which uh, I think many of us have been curious about. This is what's behind it. It's a miniature that was done around 1801 uh, Vanderlyn is about 20 years old, and um, he did many miniatures, but this one happens to be light sensitive. Um, when I um, acquired this picture, I actually did something that I wasn't supposed to do. Um, after Dina um, Preston, and I want to thank her, she's the person I worked with here, uh, had told me about how light sensitive this was, uh, she showed me the the um, work behind the curtain. And I, just through some instinct, I took my camera and I used my flash, which was a actually not a very good thing to do. But Dina said it, that it wouldn't hurt anything. So, um, so we're, we were OK on that score. Uh, moving along, uh, these are the early years. Uh, this a group of paintings are the, the beginnings of Vanderlyn's career. They're in the, lower, they're in the back uh, of this room. Each, each of the walls of this room we are in tell an episode in the life of a very famous artist. Although he had difficulties in his pursuit of the art he loved, he nevertheless soared to great heights. He may not have been financially successful, but his work, especially his portrait work, brought him from rural Kingston, New York, to Paris, Rome, and London, and to the attention of the most prominent people in this country and the world. Um, what we're looking at in the back part of the room is, is early life uh, and, and, the, and his first paintings. Um, now, a little bit about him. Um, John Vanderlyn was born on October 16, 1775 in Kingston, New York, the son of Nicholas Vanderlyn and Sarah Tappan, and the grandson of Peter Vanderlyn, also a painter who lived in Holland and then came to America. And he, he, John Vanderlyn first lived on the north side of John Street, where John Street intersects Wall Street. And 
if we go back into our history, um, Wall Street did not continue past where that X is uh, on the map. Uh, it ended there and was extended later in the 1800s, later 1800s. Um, now, uh, his house was, was located approximately at that intersection uh, of John Street and uh, Wall Street. And it was burned by the British in 1777, and it was never rebuilt. However, he lived in a lean-to made in the kitchen part of the house. Amazing. Over time, this was made more uh, permanent, but it was cramped quarters. He received his early education at Kingston Academy, where he excelled. At 10, he demonstrated his strong artistic ability. At 14, he was a very sophisticated artist. He did this particular sketch when he was 14 years old. And uh, imagination, uh, skill, it's all there. I mean, he, he was just a fabulous artist, uh, even at a very young age. Uh, Vanderlyn set out uh, for fame and fortune for New York City at the age of 16. He gained employment working for an art supplier Thomas Barrow, an importer of engravings and artist materials and picture framing. Vanderlyn spent his nights attending the drawing school run by Alexander and Archibald Robertson, the Columbia Academy of Painting. It was a school for the wealthy whose children were artistically inclined. Very, very important man in Vanderlyn's career, Aaron Burr. Um, at his day job, Vanderlyn met uh, Gilbert Stewart, who was a customer of Barrow's store. It was there that Gilbert Stewart left off two paintings to be framed, one, and one was of Aaron Burr. Vanderlyn requested permission to copy the two paintings, and it was granted. At that time, it was not unusual for a master, uh, if, if he saw some potential in a student, and a student asked him if he could copy his work, it was not a big deal for him to say yes. Uh, it was how, uh, it was an apprenticeship system. It was how people learned how to, to get better. Um, and Aaron Burr did indeed get better. In 1795, he left New York City and came back to Kingston with the portraits, which he sold. The Burr portrait was purchased by U.S. Congressman Peter Van Gas Gasbeck, a friend of the then U.S. Senator Aaron Burr. Burt heard of the quality of these portraits and was so taken by Vanderlyn's port potential that he concluded he should support this talented young artist. Burr was so impressed, he brought him to live in his household and then sent him to study with Gilbert Stewart, the person whose was painting he had, he had copied, the renowned portrait painter in Philadelphia as a student. Stewart was also very taken with Vanderlyn's talent. Okay, in 1796, Vanderlyn was again allowed to make copies from some of Stewart's work, including George Washington. This piece is actually in the back of this room. And if you were to look at it very closely, you'd see that it isn't really that skilled. It's a student work. And the neck's a little bit elongated. Um, the background is kind of crudely painted. These are, these are his early years, and all of that was very quick to go away, and his the refinement of his portrait work became outstanding in a short amount of time. He also learned the art of painting miniatures during this time period. In 1801, he made the miniature of the Eye of Theodosia, Burr's daughter. Um, one of the things about, about these uh, miniatures is they are indeed miniature. Uh, the piece to the right um, is probably an inch and a half wide. The eye of Theodosia is smaller than a dime. Um, this, this had a, a particular interest. People liked to have these miniatures, and especially these eyes were very popular for a pretty short amount of time in history. But it was just at the time when, when Vanderlyn was around, and uh, it was something that he did master. Now, 
Um, Burr thought that Vanderlyn should go to Europe to study art, and he arranged for him to go to Paris. He stayed in Paris. His stay in Paris was extremely rewarding, where Vanderlyn received many commissions for portraits and a taste for fine art he would have never gotten an opportunity here in America. He was educated in the neoclassical art style of the day and was a high-ranking student, excelling at anatomy and receiving much praise. This is where we're really within just a few years of what we just saw with the Washington piece, and this is so much of an incredibly better portrait. Uh, the person that the portrait is of, Madame de Valais and son, was, she was the mistress of Rousseau. And so he, as you can see, he was starting to move in much higher circles. He's in Paris at this time. And this is considered one of his best works in Paris. And the original is, is sitting over uh, to my left. Um, and it, it's just an amazing piece. Now we get into a story. The intertwining of Vanderlyn with Aaron Burr's life and family created conjecture about a romance between Theodosia, Aaron Burr's daughter, and John. They were eight years apart in age. Although no one knows for sure, many experts have concluded that they were close friends only. John did not seem to have any romantic interest in Theodosia nor did Burr encourage any, as he wanted his well-educated daughter to marry into a Southern political family, which she did. Um, so really, uh, we find with um, John Vanderlyn uh, that he was a single guy. He liked, seemed to like it that way. Um, he seemed to be very absorbed in his artwork. He never married, he never had any children. And we don't know anything about his, his romantic life at all, other than he didn't seem to have one for Theodosia. It is, it is presumed. It is Theodosia's honeymoon to Niagara Falls that in 1801 prompted an interest for John to go there and to make a study of the falls, that's here, um, to be used as a basis for prints and paintings for the future. He, made, he went out to Niagara Falls, which was really far away. Buffalo was the end of the, of the world at the time. And he had heard about this beautiful place. And he, had done, uh, he did all of these sketches, several of which are here. And um, he kept these sketches for later use, um, for exposure later. He didn't really do that much with them at the time in 1801. They come up later in the story. Okay, now we're looking at a different group of, of, of uh, pieces that are here. It's, it's this wall that's um, right uh, to the left of the screen, and this has to do with much of the work that he did in Europe. He spent a lot of his youth in Europe. Uh, he spent a lot more time in Europe than he did in America, and it really influenced his thinking. This is from 1803 to 1815. Um, and uh, in 1804, it was a turning point in Vanderlyn's career. As a result of the ill-fated duel between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, Burr was tried for treason and went into exile to Paris. Uh, supported, support for Vanderlyn's career began to fade as Burr was now out of favor and commissions were drying up. So. Uh, Burr had a duel with Alexander Hamilton, that's well known. Um, although he was acquitted on treason charges, the People's Court said that he was guilty, basically, and he just wasn't doing well in America and decided to go to France. Um, Burr's reputation was tarnished forever. Burr and Vanderlyn remained friends in France, and Burr encouraged Vanderlyn to return to America. He thought that he had a bright future still ahead of him and that he should put his association with him behind him and just go on to do great things in America. Vanderlyn disagreed and wanted to stay in Europe, so Vanderlyn uh, decided to stay in Europe and continue with his education and, and some other things that he did. Um, this was along the lines of, of neoclassical art. Um, this is a 
this is actually something that he copied uh, that was very common in those days to go to, this was an ancient, this was an old uh, piece of mythology that was painted by Karaji uh, many, many years ago, and uh, it was considered to be high art during the neoclassical period and something that uh, Vanderlyn very much wanted to copy and to imbue those, those um, uh, attributes. France and much of Europe was now under Napoleon's rule, and Vanderlyn traveled broadly, getting better at his craft, especially anatomy. I think that shows here. Um, it is at this time that Vanderlyn learned the hierarchy of high art and the neoclassical ideals of painting. The well-educated European would view artwork on this scale. Mythology and historic paintings and panorama paintings were on the pure and highly desirable end. Portrait painting was on the common or low end of the scale. Vanderlyn was completely and indelibly marked by this division for the rest of his life. So we're going to be about to move on to one of his original works, which is um, Caius Marius Amid the Ruins of Carthage. <clears throat> A definite high point in Vanderlyn's career was the 1806 painting of Caius Marius amid the ruins of Carthage, painting while he was in Italy. Um, there is a lot of similarities between the fallen Roman man of power, Marius, a powerful Roman general, shown in defeat. He was a extremely, this, this is a true story, um, Caius Marius, or Gaius Marius, depending on what you look up, uh, was a consulate uh, many times, to several times. He was a highly, uh, he was a high-end general, uh, commanded uh, multitudes of troops and, and was very powerful. Uh, he fell into a situation where there was a conspiracy against him and uh, eventually um, the power structure shifted and he was thrown out of power. So we have this, um, where he's shown in defeat, and the fallen man, Aaron Burr, whose career was now ruined forever. People have drawn similarities between the two men. This man was in ruin after being very powerful, and Aaron Burr, who was vice president, uh, was now in ruin, and, and he also was no longer in power. In 1808, the Marius painting, while on exhibit at a Paris salon, won a gold medal from Napoleon himself. Napoleon wanted to purchase the work and put it in the Louvre. Actually, Napoleon wanted to purchase this thing, purchase this work and put it in the Louvre, and Vanderlyn refuses him. Amazing. Um, you're starting to get an idea of the personality of Vanderlyn, that he could actually refuse Napoleon. And he, what he really wanted to do was to place this on tour and to make money at it while, when he went back to America. Another major work to be completed at this time was based on a Greek myth and was another success for Vanderlyn. In 1809, Vanderlyn painted uh, Ariadne asleep on the island of Naxos to great European acc acclaim. Now what we're seeing here is the work that's here, right behind me. Um, in the gallery, and it is not the original work. The original work was a nude. And um, although this painting, the, the, the nude in Europe was a big sensation, it was a big hit. There was a lot, that wasn't the first nude that they had ever seen in Europe, and, and it, had, it was looked at as, as extremely well done artwork, and lots of people copied it, and it's considered one of his best works. But, when he tried to show it in America, the American ethics were quite different. And what they did is they broke the viewing into a male audience and a female audience. So they had, um, they had days when it was shown only to men, and there were days that it was only shown to women. And uh, what were the picture that we're showing here that is behind me, um, in America, a nude was not acceptable, and Vanderlyn had to compromise by painting a copy that had a draped figure. 
This work was for a steamboat captain, the one behind me, and it was displayed in the main salon of the steamboat Albany. Um, so this, that's what's on display here. Next on the agenda were the sketches of a massive project that Vanderlyn would undertake in years ahead, the panorama view of the palace and gardens of Versailles. Very important painting in his career. It's a massive piece. Um, panoramas were very popular at the time and very profitable to the artist. Vanderlyn wanted to be part of this movement. And what I mean by movement is you have to understand a little bit about what a panorama is and what it did. Um, basically, if you can think of an IMAX being a building that's constructed to show these, these large formatted different formatted movies, but the theater itself had to be constructed in such a way to show that. Um, the panoramas and the dioramas were also constructed to, to um, hold these really unique sort of paintings. Um, and they were very, it was a very popular source of entertainment, and it was also something that, um, that made money. Uh, I'm contrasting two different panoramas here. The one on the top is a portion of the Versailles piece, the Gardens of Versailles, that Vanderlyn did. Uh, the one below it is fairly typical of the types of paintings that were being done in Europe at the time of battles. This happens to be the water of, Bat of Waterloo that, uh, during the Napoleonic times. And, um, people really gravitated to these extravaganzas of, of battles. And a little less popular were things that were, that were uh, trying to be artistic and, and a little less spectacular. Um, but uh, these things were housed very specifically. Um, many uh, round buildings and rooms were constructed for, for public ex exhibition throughout Europe in America at this time. There were, there were round buildings that were constructed that would just have these panoramas in them. Paintings were massive, sometimes 20 feet high and hundreds of feet long, and made to be viewed in a circular room. Um, these were, spect were uh, spectacles, usually of European cities and the, and the many famous battles being fought all over Europe. Started around 1793, there were 126 panoramas displayed in London through 1863, a 70-year heyday period. One of the artists, Robert Barker, became famous for his panorama, for his panoramas, and made his fortune. Now that did not go, one of the things about Vanderlyn that you will find out is he was someone that was very interested in fame and he was very interested in fortune. And this did not pass by him. He wanted to do panoramas, and he wanted to make his he wanted to make a fortune from them. Uh, Vanderlyn caught the bug and, pers and pursued panorama painting as his number one priority in his stubborn quest for fame and fortune for the rest of his life. But he sought these out as high end art, not lowbrow art for the masses. So he started off with the premise that these would be spectacularly wonderful very uh, neoclassical pieces of artwork, which is really not what was popular at the time. Uh, something that was more spectacular would draw a bigger audience and make the person more money. He just sort of ignored that. That is not what he wanted to do. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what a diorama was because um, I, I don't think we, we have that concept today of, of uh, what this kind of entertainment was. Um, a diorama was much more like an auditorium room with a slightly curved um, screen, you might say, only it was actually a canvas that off to the sides, uh, there were two cranks. On, there was a crank on each end. And canvas would be cranked through this across the screen and that's what the audience and chairs would be seeing. They would be seeing something that would be moving, like a trip down the Mississippi or a battle scene. And 
to add to the spectacular, they would have um, they would have battle scene types of props strewn across the stage, and that they would also have um, the sounds of artillery and, and other sound effects going on. So what are we actually talking about? We're talking about something that is pre-motion pictures. And if you think about why people go to the motion pictures, they don't necessarily go as if they're going to a gallery to see some, some spectacular piece of art. They're going to be entertained. And that's what a lot of this had to do with. And that was, uh, that's what dioramas were about. Uh, along with panoramas, which were static round pieces where you'd sit in the middle, and you'd sort of get mesmerized by being somewhere else. But they were very quiet affairs. Okay. Uh, again, I'm pulling the artwork from this room. Um, and this is a handbill advertising um, an exhibit of Vanderlyn's. After the War of 1812, Vanderlyn was ready to return to America, and he couldn't make it back until 1816 after the war. So he was in Europe for quite a while. In America, panoramas and dioramas were in great popularity, but in America they were not seen as high art, but art to thrill the masses. Here is a handbill advertising one of, the pa of his panoramas and portraiture show. Uh, he used these handbills to get people to come to see his his work, um, and he used the panoramas as a kind of a hook to get you there, and then he had his portrait work up as well. In this case, he, had, he actually had on display uh, his, uh, his Ariadne um, and his Caius Marius piece for people to see here. So he did do what he said he was going to do, he exhibited that. Um, one of Vanderlyn's greatest achievements was a panorama which is now on permanent display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. A scale version of combined sketches for this work are seen in the lobby of the Senate House. As you walk into the Senate House, uh, they've designed it so that it's a round space and it duplicates to a certain degree, a much smaller scale, Van with Vanderlyn's sketches, um, the rotunda, that was eventually built to, to house his, his piece that he did. And later on, it was picked up in the Museum of, of, uh, Modern, uh, Museum of Art in New York City. Um, and uh, we're looking at it here, at least segments of it. Uh, you get an idea of the scale in the middle uh, picture. Uh, the dark, there's two dark, there are two dark figures of people that are sitting and you can get some, some idea of the scale of the piece. It's, it's actually massive. Um, and uh, two years after returning from Europe, between 1818 and 1819, Vanderlyn painted this uh, palace and gardens of Versailles. It's 169.5 inches long. It's a circular canvas and a master achievement. It's actually the length, it's a little bit longer than three tractor trailers. If you took those and made those into a circle, th that's how big this piece is. So it, it was it's pretty remarkably big. Now, he wanted this thing in his, he wanted this under his own control. He contracted with New York City to have a rotunda built in City Hall Park with a nine-year lease to display it, uh, along with his other panoramas and his portraiture. This was a major financial gamble on his part. As the years passed, it became clear that this would be a financial loss for Vanderlyn. Um, suffering this defeat, his disposition was definitely no longer optimistic. So, um, unfortunately, people were not tremendously interested in sitting and looking at a garden is what it kind of came down to. That's not the way the American audience behaved. They wanted something spectacular to look at. And he charged admission to this and um, just didn't come up to what his, um, his lease was. So he was losing quickly time and money and it wasn't looking good for that lease. So 
uh, he, John Vanderlyn had now turned into a very bitter, unpleasant, and stubborn person. He might also be defined, you might also define him as a prima donna. Uh, I'll get into that in a little while. As early as 1822, his bad disposition became so apparent that he was advised to, quote, imbibe daily a reasonable quantity of strong beer because it made him easier to deal with. So it was noticed that his disposition was, was let's just say arrogant, I think would be a good word. Um, and one of the examples of that is uh, James Audubon, um, the naturalist who did all, all of our birds, a wonderful, incredible collection, beautiful art, done in uh, James Audubon's own style, which um, Vanderlyn, um, he, came, he came to Vanderlyn. He wanted Vanderlyn to critique his work, um, just an honest critique. Um, he came there, and Vanderlyn was known for making people wait. Um, he made his models wait when he did portraits. It was just something that he did just to kind of impose that I'm the king here, and you're not that important. So he did that to James Audubon, and when he finally saw him, he gave him a harsh and unjustified aristocratic view of his work. And um, Audubon wasn't dissuaded. He went on to do what he did. And uh, they remained in contact with each other, but they, didn't, they did not remain friends. Um, in 1826, John Vanderlyn, this has to do with his rotunda now, um, his rotunda was starting to get into jeopardy. And he found out that a group of his, a group that he belonged to um, was planning something um, that was actually, they, it wasn't very nice what they were doing. And um, uh, they were planning on taking over his rotunda once his lease ran out. So he lashed out at the group of his friends for their secret dealings to take over his rotunda once the lease ran out. This group, headed by Samuel Morris, who is also, uh, uh, we know him as the inventor of the telegraph, but he's also a very good painter. Um, we had a large collection of his in Syracuse University while I, when I was there, and I can attest to that fact. He was a, he was a very good painter and William Dunlap, who wrote many plays and, and also was an artist. Um, these men um, had just before made John Vanderlyn a member of their National Gallery of Design. Um, now, okay, these guys were out of line by jumping the gun on the um, rotunda, trying to pull it out from under them. But trying to pull it out from under them and having Vanderlyn lash out at them in a very nasty way. It kind of sealed Vanderlyn's fate. Had he held his temper, the Rotunda project may have worked out differently. Instead, he lost his membership in the National Gallery of Design. He lost his friends. They did not want to have anything to do with him. And he lost his Rotunda anyway. Now, coming up to an interesting story. We have the painting of, the, of Niagara Falls, which is in this gallery. It's a very large painting here. It's the largest painting of his we have. And it, it shares some similarities with the Hudson River School. But here's the scoop, as far as I could find. Uh, a topic which has come under much discussion concerning John, John Vanderlyn is the Hudson River School. Was John Vanderlyn ahead of his time with the Hudson River School style as depicted in his painting of Niagara Falls? I think not. I'll tell you why. Although I'm sure he was aware of the movement, Thomas Cole lived at roughly the same time as John Vanderlyn, and Cole's Niagara Falls painting was done in 1830, 11 years before this one was done. And <clears throat> Although these paintings and prints, he not only made paintings of Niagara Falls, he also made some prints, not many prints. Um, and there's a story about that that I'll tell you in a while. Uh, they were greatly admired, 
Um, Joan Manderlin didn't seem to have the soul of a Hudson River School painter. Um, he really wasn't that interested in that, the beauty of nature and all that nature symbolized to the Hudson River School people. And he didn't seem to have the nationalistic uh, approach that America in its natural form was beautiful. And that was a complete break from European art. Um, he just kind of said, no, this is not what I want to do. Um, so he was quick to dismiss this natural beauty direction. And he went right back to his historical painting pursuits of the neoclassical style. On April 21st, 1818, during the time of the Versailles Panorama, he was deaf to the excellent advice given in a publication by an unnamed author. This is a quote from that time, 1818. Although it is not to, to have been expected that Mr. Vanderlyn would have left the high department of historical painting in which he is so eminent to devote his time to the more humble, though more profitable, pursuit of painting cities and landscapes, this type of art would not only be highly national and popular, but exceedingly profitable." End of quote. This article suggests that Va John Vanderlyn was barking up the wrong tree, trying to impose European neoclassical art on, on Americans whose education and tastes were not interested in, the, in this old world style. The American people, however, had different tastes, like the Hudson River School, among others that John Vanderlyn refused to pursue, which would have gotten him much further ahead with both fame and fortune. So he just ignored it. He ignored an entire market which was ready and willing to accept it, but he, didn't, he just didn't want to do it. He had been in Europe for a very long time, and it really influenced what, how he pursued his artwork. So. One of the things that he's very famous for, and I think most famous for, and something that he himself didn't give enough credit to, was his portrait work. And we're looking at two pieces that are pretty typical of his portrait work, his sophisticated portrait work. They're directly behind me on this mantle here. And uh, one of them is of his niece, that's Jane Elijah Vaughan, that's to the left. And the other one is of Mary Harrison Sudam. And she is the wife of the Honorable John Sudam, lawyer and member of the uh, State Senate in Kingston. Now, one of the reasons that I think patrons sought him out or he sought patrons out was, first of all, they had to be fairly well off. Um, and also people that could help him he, u he did utilize people that could help him with his career. Um, John Sudam, the husband of, of um, Mary, was a, a lawyer, and he used one of his paintings. He actually used the Caius uh, Marius painting as collateral for a loan. And obviously then, there was money that... that um, that Vanderlyn could get. Money, money was always hard to come by, and it's what he used for his portraits. So he got, some, he got money out of the deal, and I'm sure it drove how he did his portraits, and who he did them of. So we do know that John Vanderlyn kept stubbornly pursuing his neoclassical historical painting artwork plans, but in reality, he, mostly forced, he was mostly forced to paint portraits for a living and exhibited other people's panoramas and was just treading water and getting more bitter. So he didn't feel as though he was getting ahead doing this kind of work where we see this now as his strongest point. Um, one idea that did come to fruition was a painting commissioned by the U.S. Congress. This is extremely important. Now, this is, we're looking at the back of, of the room we're in right now and these really are just sketches and some fragments of, of um, pieces from uh, one of his most famous and most ambitious works. Um, 
In 1836, he was asked by Congress to paint one of the murals for the Capitol Building Rotunda in Washington, D.C. Now, we can see some details of what's back there. Um, these are sketches that he did for this piece for Washington, D.C. What was it? With the award of the commission for painting one of the panels, um, Vanderlyn finally realized his great ambition to paint an historic painting here in America. As a subject, he selected the landing of Columbus, and in 1838 sailed to Havana to sketch the tropical scenery and foliage that would serve as a background to the painting. No internet there couldn't go to images and find foliage, tropical foliage. He had to go to Havana to do it. And after he went to Havana to do the tropical work, he goes to Paris to paint the landing of Columbus. A very odd decision, I thought. That's what he did. And he spent a long time working on this. Um, when he returned to Paris, it was not the city of his happy youth. It had changed. He became lonely and homesick and made little progress on the painting and frittered away much of his time and money. By 1842, he made a bad business deal on his $2,000 advance and lost his living money. He was pretty famous for not having very good business sense and ending up um, owing money to people to support him. He then returned to copying the masters, as he had done earlier, as he had done as a student to continue to support himself in France. Rumors spread about who exactly was working on the painting of Columbus. Time's going on, What's go what is happening with that? This is the painting of the landing of Columbus. This painting uh, is exhibited, it's one of several. It's in the uh, rotunda in the Capitol building of the United States, the United States Capitol building. Uh, it was rumored that he did not paint the work, but left it up to his French assistant to do the painting. Now, one thing you have to understand of the time, this might be partially true, but not entirely true. It is a common practice and tradition for master artists to do the planning, to have assistants do more mundane parts of a work. Um, oftentimes, a painting the sky was a pretty mundane task, or painting the, the scenery in the background, the plants or something. Maybe there was someone in his crew that was good at that, let them do it. It's done on murals today. Um, it's just a common way of working. But people were not buying into that. People thought um, that he wasn't doing any of it. And that was the rumors that were spreading. Too much time was going by. Um, Americans still doubted how much personal attention Vanderlyn had put into this work. And so he came under attack for his actual participation in the work at all. Today, we have accepted this as an original Vanderlyn. But at the time, Vanderlyn had to defend himself as best he could. It took 10 years for him to complete this painting. He struggled. He really struggled with this. Uh, when he returned to America, there was very little interest in it, which was a huge disappointment. Um, for some reason, it just didn't capture anyone's Im imagination at the time. And people just sort of ignored it. It, it did not have the impact that he wanted. Um, now, um, at the same time that he was working on the Columbus work in Paris, he also completed the painting of Niagara Falls. The painting of Niagara Falls, oddly enough, was painted in Paris. Not only that, um, the painting of Niagara Falls was done in 1842, 1842, based on sketches that had, but, that had been done on a trip there in 1801, 41 years earlier. So when he was a young lad and had gone off to Niagara Falls and made his sketches, um, those were the sketches that he drew on t to do this painting. Um, from his sketches, he hoped to make money from converting them into prints. Now, he's in Europe right now, and he's traveling around. Um, 
And one thing that happened was uh, when you, he had an idea of making prints of Niagara Falls and selling them, not only in Europe, but he had hoped to come back to America and sell them there. It was making, like we would sell prints today of, of our artwork and um, make money from that. He was looking to do that. But at the time, what you had to do is take your sketch and give it to a, a, a good, the better the engraver, the better, but the, the more it would be worth. You'd give it to an engraver, and an engraver would copy it onto a plate and then make prints off the plate. So the plates were very important. Well, he was in one city when he found the engraver and gave him all his sketches from his youth. And they were supposed to be shipped to him um, in another city in Europe where he traveled to. And they were shipped, but they never arrived. And this was a sizable collection, it's something that really was important to uh, Vanderlyn at the time. And he spent several years trying to hunt those plates down without any luck. So he was completely out of luck with that whole idea. He had to give it up because he just didn't have them. So it never became a reality. OK. Um, so Mo we're, we're getting now into his late years. Um, he had some tremendous up ups. I mean, if Napoleon wanted to put his work in the Louvre, um, his, his work was admired. His portrait work was without uh, um, any hesitation, some of the, the best portrait work. And that is also indicated by the kinds of people that hired him. Um, he did several presidents, including Zachary Taylor, which was at the end of his life. Um, he died in 1852, so we're getting close here. It did take, it did not take long for John Vanderlyn to spend the remaining money he had made from the Columbus uh, project, and until the end of his life, he remained impoverished. In 1850, he painted one final important portrait. He's back in America now. He's returned um, to America. Uh, the important portrait of President Zachary Taylor. Stubborn as Vanderlyn was, he was also a visionary. Before he died, between 1850 and 1852, many of Vanderlyn's letters referred to his desire to establish a national gallery in Washington, D.C. In August of 1852, he asked the Senate for an appropriation of public land and to construct a building to serve as a gallery and an art school. This request was denied. Vanderlyn's final letter expressed his frustration of a lifetime trying to generate interest in the education of Americans in the arts. He wrote, to think there is not one member in either house of Congress that takes interest enough in art or public learning to become its champion is a sorry circumstance for the age and the country. End of quote. Okay. Okay, we are now at the end of Vanderlyn's life. In September 1852, he at last returns to Kingston. He borrowed money to rent a room at a Kingston hotel where, on September 23rd, 77 year old John Vanderlyn died a bitter man and an impoverished man. He was buried in Wiltwick Cemetery. And I just learned that. Uh, that his monument was um, funded by uh, devotees of John Vanderlyn. They uh, put together the money for his monument. So, because he was that poor. Now, we're gonna go on to just the man and some of his accomplishments. This room contains many hidden and buried treasures left by the highly talented John Vanderlyn. His accomplishments were many. He painted portraits of the most famous people of his time, including George Washington for the US, uh, the US House of Representat Representatives, James Monroe, John C. Calhoun, Governor Joseph C. Yates, Governor George Clinton, which I understand is a stunning painting in Albany, um, Andrew Jackson, and Zachary Taylor. 
just gives you some idea of the scope of who he painted. He also exhibited panoramas and had a rotunda built in New York City, which displayed panoramas of Paris, Athens, Mexico, and one of his great, greatest achievements, his own Versailles Gardens. Vanderlyn was the first American to study in France instead of in England. His accomplishments are undeniably many, and he was a great talent in his time. After his death, his work, The Landing of Columbus, which is one of the panels displayed in the United States Capitol building, was transferred as an engraving in 1875 to a U.S. currency $5 bill and to two stamps, a 15 cent stamp in 1869 and a two cent stamp, which was a, the common stamp of the time. So it was well seen in 1892. At long last, there was confirmation of his, of his historic work. We view Vanderlyn today as a great talent and an artist who dedicated his life to educating his audience. And that's the end of my presentation.